توی دشت شقایق جایی که گلها با گلبرک های مخملی قرمز با هم توی باد می رقصیدند داستانی از اراده مردمی روایت می شد که برای آزادی دشت تلاش می کردن. توی اون دشت زنان و مردان شجای زندگی می کردند که با چشم هایی پر از امید برای آزادیشون می جنگیدند. داستان این مردم مثل یک سفر پر از رنج بود. سفری که به خاطرش دل مادرهای دشت شقایق خون شده بود. ولی با این حال از شجاعت اونها چیزی کم نمی کرد. اونها تو سیاه ترین لحظه ها کنار هم بودن. درست مثل گلهای قشنگ قالی هاشون که در کنار هم پر از زیبایی و اصالت بودن. با وجود همه غمها قهرمانان دشت شقایق هر روز با اراده خستگی ناپذیر برای زن، زندگی، آزادی دوباره شروع می کردن. حتی به قیمت فدا کردن جونهاشون و چشماشون. حالا خیلی از شقایق های زیبای دشت دیگه بین ما نیستند. ولی اونهایی که موندن به یادشون آزادی رو با چشمهاشون فریاد میزنن. هرچند که چشمها رنگ خون گرفته. ولی صدای چشمها از هر فریادی بلندتره. Black Space by Afatasi the Artist. Mission One Origins. Statesman, entrepreneur, diplomat, captain, visionary, a California founding father, and the first African American millionaire. There is a four block alley in San Francisco dedicated to the legacy of William Alexander Leidesdorf. Copy that, Mission Control. How long is Washington Street in San Francisco? Over. Almost 50 blocks. Shh. Abolitionist, entrepreneur, financier, 
real estate magnate, freedom fighter, a capitalist by nature. She is the mother of civil rights in California, the smallest park in San Francisco, which consists of a plaque and six eucalyptus trees where her 30 room mansion once stood, as well as a one block alley are dedicated to the legacy of Mary Ellen Pleasant. Copy that mission control. How big is Lafayette Park in San Francisco? About 11 and a half acres. Copy that mission control. Lafayette wasn't even an American. Over. Mission two. The Annihilation. In 1949, President Truman passed the Housing Act, which authorized the demolition of urban neighborhoods considered slums. I imagine it'd be easy for any white person walking through San Francisco to imagine everything was at peace because it certainly looks that way on the surface. You've got the San Francisco legend too, which is that it's a cosmopolitan and forward thinking, but it's just another American city. James Baldwin, 1963. I's the onlyest one alive. I's the onlyest one alive. Mission three. Traces. I'll tell you about San Francisco. The white man, he's not taking advantage of you out in public like they do down in Birmingham, but he's killing you with that pencil and paper, brother. Take this hammer, 1963. I'm trying to hold on to evidence that blacks ever existed in San Francisco. London Breed, 2015. The San Francisco Bay was once home to a thriving Chinese shrimp fishery. In the late 19th century, more than 26 Chinese shrimp camps ringed the bay, exporting over 3 million pounds of dried shrimp a year to Asia. But by the mid-20th century, discriminatory laws effectively shut down the Chinese shrimp fishing industry. Today, only the vestiges of one site remains. Artist Rennie Young, herself an immigrant, developed the project Chinese Whispers Bay Chronicles to retrace this forgotten history of a forgotten immigrant community. Using today's technology to capture traces of the past, a team of artists, historical ecologists, and cultural experts set sail on the National Park Service's replica 19th century junk the Gray Kwan, to former Chinese shrimping sites around San Francisco Bay. Ranger John Muir, who led the building of the Gray Kwan, was our skipper. The Bay Chronicles voyage began at China Camp, the only remaining shrimp camp site on San Francisco Bay today. In the 1880s, China Camp was a bustling village with nearly 500 residents. Frank Kwan, China Camp's only remaining resident, joined us on the sail. We sailed east across San Pablo Bay to Richmond.
just north of the port of Richmond, a major shipping terminal today, a productive Chinese shrimp camp operated at Point Malati from the 1870s until the early 20th century. We wanted to capture not only the sights, but the sound of the voyage. It was an eight-hour voyage sailing across San Francisco Bay from Richmond down to San Mateo in the South Bay. Sailing south to the mid-peninsula marshlands was full of contrasts. A third of the bay has been covered over by landfill since the gold rush. But here in the tidal marsh, we could almost imagine what it was like when the Chinese fishermen navigated these sloughs in the 19th century. Historical maps guided us through tidal wetlands to the site of a forgotten Chinese fishing camp from the 1890s near Redwood City. That's all right. no one can yell at you. From Redwood City, we began our return no. sail. We stopped at Point San Bruno to look for the former site of a sizable Chinese fishing village that was here in the late 19th century. I'm sure it looked completely different back then, huh? Oh, yeah. And we looked oh, at all not the... not really. I don't think... Oh, all the pompous grass. Out the build, put out the building, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is one of the larger camps, as far as I can read, yeah. Frank brought an offering for the fishermen who once fished here. The shores of India Basin on Hundreds Point in San Francisco were home to the largest community of Chinese shrimp fishermen in the bay. It flourished until 1938, when the land was taken over for the naval shipyard and the fishermen's docks and buildings were burned down. Today, the abandoned shipyard is slated to become a major housing development. The shorescape changed as we headed toward the city and the Golden Gate. You gotta give me a better angle so I can see the wood. There we go. full circle around, we sailed from San Francisco back up to China Camp. Along the way, we glimpsed silent traces of where the early Chinese immigrants had been detained on Angel Island in their journey to America in search of livelihood and belonging.
Landing at China Camp Village was like a homecoming after our voyage on the bay. We can't recreate 150 years of erased history. But in retracing this forgotten history, we can only reimagine, and most importantly, retell the story of Chinese shrimp fishing in San Francisco Bay and honor the memory of an immigrant community which had enriched the vibrancy of the San Francisco Bay region.
prevent the next war. Only if you suffer will you make other people suffer. If you are peaceful and happy, you won't inflict suffering on other people. Every time the siren came, we got to get out of the house. One that particular time, I remember very clearly. You know, we run there and uh, maybe sitting there and wait for about 30 minutes till the silent release again get to safe to come out. So we came out and, and I went into the house and my father pointed to the Buddha hall. You know, wow, it's the Buddha hall. So I, as big as the four or five inches uh, in diameter goes through the front top of the, the wall, and then hit something and then turn it out. We, we were scared, yeah. How can this happen? That's the wall. It is impossible. Do you remember what the bunker looked like? Oh, yeah, like? bunker is, uh, I, I still remember the soil is a kind of damp. It's not a good place to, to hide there, but it's uh, deep enough, six feet. I think that the wood pieces is kind of covered that uh, on top of the wood pieces and their soil. The shooting was very intensive. And then uh, I think they came with a purpose to destroy the sugar plant. I remember yeah. you told me that when I was a kid. Yeah, the story. Yeah, I, I remember that. that bombing. Yeah. Looking deeply, we can see how we have helped create the suffering in those who inflict violence through our forgetfulness and through the way we live our daily lives. We have to learn to produce right thinking, speech, and action that is free of violence, anger, hate, and fear. Mom tells me she was four years old in 1943 when the American bombs destroyed a home down the block from theirs in Pingdong City, Taiwan, near the railroad tracks. She said she will never, ever forget the corpses that were carried out of that house. She said her parents immediately moved the family to a rented shelter from indigenous families in the mountains and traded cloth with them for livestock to survive. Her and her siblings were often left alone eating watery rice. We know very well that violence only creates more violence, yet violence has become the substance of our lives. Many of us live in places where there's fighting in the streets and in our homes. Is it any wonder, then, that we fight and see violence as the way to solve problems? Mr. Fitzgerald was my U.S. history teacher in high school and was the only teacher to inquire about my parents' origins. He was also a Vietnam War veteran, honorably discharged due to his injuries. I'll never forget him explaining how he was shot and showing us the chaotic scar on his smaller left arm. He was also disillusioned with the purpose of war. I paid him a visit once during my college break to talk about my work in American studies. He showed me dozens of bookcases obsessively, hauntingly, filled with his media collections of the Vietnam War. He thought the movie Platoon best captured what he remembered. If we want to protect life, we have to look deeply as individuals and as a nation into the true nature of violence and war. We have to do everything in our power to prevent war from happening again. My civil rights colleague, Gary, disappeared one day as quickly as he appeared. Gary is a Japanese American who fought on the front lines in Vietnam. He was shot at by the Vietnamese and the Americans, especially at night. An academic researcher reached out to interview him about his war experiences as an Asian American. Since then, we have not heard from him. If we only protest, we will not be ready when the next war comes in five or ten years. To prevent the next war, we have to practice peace today. Grandpa, Grandma, I want to stay here. Please let me die here with you. I haven't anyone else. 
I looked so hard for my sisters, but I didn't find them, so I'm sure they're dead. My brother Chokuyu died at Komesu. Two of my older brothers joined the army and went off to fight and haven't come back. My other brother went to the mainland and never returned. My oldest sister married and lived in Naha, but that's where the first bombs fell. And my father said the whole city burned and she must have died. And my next oldest sister got married and went to Saipan. So there's only me left. Now listen to me carefully, Tomiko, he said. I told you just now that human life is the most precious thing in the world. Yes, sir, I replied. You're a good girl, Tomiko. You can see for yourself that we are not in very good shape and can't expect to live much longer. If, when you're grown up, you remember this old man and this old woman and think about us sometimes, that's all we ask. Even if our bodies die, we will be able to live on in your heart. That will make us happy. Can you understand that? The old man gazed at me again with his big, kindly eyes. They were moist with tears. I did not say anything. I simply nodded. If we establish peace in our hearts, in our way of looking at things, and in our way of being with each other and with the world, then we are doing our best to make sure the next war will not come. But what is different about Ire no hi being here than when you've come in the past? Because I don't know father, mm -hmm. and we don't have any pictures. Mm -hmm. So that is probably, I didn't, because that I didn't miss him much. So you come over here and see that his name, it really feels. And uh, he died in July. My younger sister was born in November. So my mother don't know war. My mother was still pregnant too, with the five kids. I, I brought, you know, towel and uh, water. I make it wet, I wipe it off. Hi, you know, Father, I'm here. And uh, I hope you sleep in peace. Then we pray and I will always, you know, thank you for uh, watch over us and uh, family and everybody. Like my age group and uh, in the uh, United States, I have about five ladies I know, but almost about the same age. Only one person have father because all, everybody went to the war and they died. Yeah, that, that's not only me. War is who, who is winning? Example, enemy have, their soldiers have, you know, parents, and, you know, if they die in war, and make them sad too, like we did. I don't know, but we need better partitions. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> war is the fruit of our collective consciousness. If we wait until another war is imminent to begin to practice peace, it will be too late. Chichi wo kaese, haha wo kaese, toshiyori wo kaese, kodomo wo kaese, watashi wo kaese, watashi ni tsunagaru ningen wo kaese, ningen no Peace begins here, now.